Senator from Iowa. Uh, I ask that the calling of the quorum be suspended. Without objection, so ordered. Morning business is closed. Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of XS649, which the clerk will report. Calendar number 32, S649, a bill to ensure that all individuals who should be prohibited from buying a firearm are listed in the National Instant Criminal Background Check System and require a background check for every firearm sale and for other purposes. Under the previous order, the time until 12.30 p.m. will be for debate only. Uh, Mr. President. Senator from Iowa. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad that we're proceeding on this uh, very important legislation. Uh, the American people might be wondering why the Senate has not been voting on any amendments to the pending gun legislation. The Senate voted on Thursday to proceed to the bill. This uh, followed calls that this uh, Senate should debate the bill. And so that's why I just said I'm glad that we're getting there. And uh, there has been very little debate. The President has said that various proposals deserve a vote. And uh, we on this side of the aisle don't intend to stand in the way of, of proceeding on those votes, particularly on the amendments. Uh, and I hope we're able to vote very soon. Last week, Senator Manchin and Toomey unveiled an amendment on background checks. The media hailed the agreement as a way to pass gun control. The majority leader announced that the Manchin-Toomey amendment would be the first one that we would vote on. But uh, just starting the debate now, obviously we haven't voted, so hopefully we'll get to the vote. Now, we haven't voted because despite claims from the other side, background checks are not and never have been the sweet spot of gun control debate. We haven't voted on it because supporters don't have the votes to pass it, at least at this point, that's the way it appears to me. And I think they know it. Uh, they don't have the votes, even though published reports indicate that Vice President Biden, the President of the Senate, has been calling senators and asking them to support the Manchin-Toomey bill. They must not be telling him what he wants to hear. They don't have the votes for background checks, even though the Vice President has reportedly stated that the op opposition to the proposal comes only from, quote unquote, the black helicopter crowd. Well, it doesn't come from that point. Manchin Toomey would impose new obligations on law-abiding gun owners. It would do so even though expanding gun background checks would have done nothing to stop Newtown or other mass killings. It would do so even though expanding background checks would do nothing to prevent these killings in the future. Uh, I often quote the deputy director of the National Institute of Justice, uh, and it was recently, uh, that institute and that person recently wrote that background checks could work only if they were universal and were accompanied by gun registration. And, of course, most members of the Senate oppose gun registration. They know what has happened historically with gun registration. It has led in other countries to confiscation. And w uh, members of the Senate, but more importantly, Lots of people appearing at our town meetings fear that and don't want to go down that road. The background check amendments claims to strengthen the rights of gun owners, but in fact it does not. The fact is the opposite is true. So opposition to the amendment does not come from fringe elements of society. In fact, one of the reasons that the Senate hasn't voted on the amendment is a wide, widespread opposition to the amendment for many quarters. If only fringe elements had problems with it, we would be voting on this amendment. So keep watching. If we do not vote on Manchin Toomey, it means that the proponents of that idea know that they don't have the votes to pass it. 
If we, uh, if we turn to assault weapons or magazines, then it is clear to all that the majority knows is far from the number of votes they need. So I think people are going to be waiting for time while they try to pick up the votes that probably will never be there. Meanwhile, on this side of the aisle, our caucus hopes to have their amendments considered soon and vote on those amendments. Our amendments, unlike Manchin Toomey, will actually strengthen the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding gun owners and help thwart gun violence by criminals. In fact, there are reports that the other side of the aisle want to block one of our amendments that would do exactly that. So I lay out what I think is the situation. Now, maybe there's leaders around here would dispute me, but that's the way I see it. The majority doesn't have the votes to pass their amendment, so we aren't voting. And the majority wants to block Republican amendments that they fear would pass. So we are either voting on, so we aren't voting on the Republican one either. The Senate voted to proceed to the bill. The Senate voted to debate. The Senate was promised an open amendment process. That would mean conducting votes, conducting votes on the various amendments that will be offered. But so far, that has not happened. Maybe soon, I hope it happens. So I ask the audience to stay tuned, and I yield the floor. Thank you very much. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. Mr. President, first I have 10 unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate with the approval of the majority and minority leaders. I ask unanimous consent these requests be agreed to and the request be printed in the record. Action. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, we are debating one of the most important bills we've had before the Senate in a long time. The reason we are debating this is because of what happened in Newtown, Connecticut on December the 14th. Gun violence takes its toll every day in America, in cities all across the country and in my home state of Illinois. And we know, because we read and hear in the news, of the victims. At this moment, our nation is saddened by what happened yesterday in Boston. We still don't know what the cause of that was, who was responsible for it. Uh, I just have to say that we're stunned by it. Members of the Senate uh, that I work with on the immigration bill had planned to uh, announce it today in a press conference. We've postponed that in respect to the people who have fallen and been injured and their families in Boston. Uh, it is a moment of grave concern across America, expressed well by the President last night. We wait for the information and details to, to build a case for those who are responsible. I, for one, and I'm sure my colleagues feel the same way, don't want to rush to judgment until we have the facts as to the parties responsible. But the sadness we feel for the victims and the sadness we feel for an America, an open and free America, where people stand on the sidelines cheering marathon runners is, is one that is profound in the Senate today. The issue before us is gun safety, and it comes before us because 20 beautiful little first graders were massacred at their grade school at Sandy Hook in the town of Newtown, Connecticut. And six of their teachers and administrators literally gave their lives in defense of those children. There's not a parent or grandparent alive who didn't identify with that horrible loss. Last week I met with a group of parents from Sandy Hook Elementary School who in their continuing grief still had the courage to come to Congress and to beg us to do something, to spare future families and future children from this type of massacre. I met with them early in the morning. There wasn't a dry eye in the room, as you can imagine, as they showed me the photographs of their beautiful little children who are gone. I commend them for their courage in stepping forward. And now the question is whether the Senate has the courage to step forward. This isn't an easy vote politically. I think we know what's at stake here. I come from a pretty diverse state. I come from downstate Illinois, more rural, more small towns, more gun owners than the great city of Chicago. And for 14 years as a congressman in downstate Illinois, I ran in an area that where gun, the gun issues were very volatile and very important to many people. 
I took some positions which the gun lobby didn't care for. And several times they decided that they would wage a campaign against me when I ran for re-election. I survived their attacks uh, and eventually was elected to the Senate here. This is the first meaningful gun safety legislation that we've taken up since I was elected to this body over 16 years ago. We're here because of Newtown, Connecticut. There's no question about it. I often remind people that it was a little over two years ago than one of our own, Gabrielle Giffords, a congresswoman from Arizona, at a town meeting, at a town meeting, was gunned down by being shot point blank in the face. And we did nothing. No hearings. No changes in the law. It was just another gun statistic to many people. But Newtown touched our hearts to think that those beautiful little children could be massacred in their grade school classroom. One child was shot 11 times, 11 times, with a semi-automatic weapon that was firing off rounds as fast as this deranged individual could load them. So we're here today in the beginning of a debate on this important legislation. What's at stake here? Well, this is about background checks. And here are the basic questions that we need to ask. Do we believe that the current federal law, which prohibits a convicted felon, a person who is under a, an order from the court to avoid domestic abuse, a person who has been judged mentally incompetent should be able to buy a gun in America? Now, 90% of Americans say that's an easy question, and the answer is no. They shouldn't be able to buy a gun. In fact, 75% of gun owners say that. I come from a family of gun owners. They are responsible, law-abiding citizens who would never dream of looking the other way if a convicted felon wanted to buy a gun or a person mentally deranged. They store their guns safely. They use them in a safe manner. And they represent the majority of gun owners across America. So if this is such an obvious question, where 90% of Americans agree that we shouldn't sell guns to those who've been convicted of felony, for example, why is this being debated? What is the big deal? It comes down to the second part of the question. What would you think, and this capital is filled with tourists, many of whom flew on airplanes to get here today, what would you think if, before the flight took off, the flight attendant said, uh, welcome aboard, hope you have a safe flight, be sure and fasten your seatbelt. Incidentally, the TSA would like to inform you that we have closely checked the passengers on board the plane to see if they're carrying guns or bombs, and we are happy to report to you that we have checked on 60% of them, and they are not carrying guns and bombs. Have a nice flight. 60%? Does that give you any refuge or consolation or peace of mind? But that's what's going on today when it comes to the sale of guns. Forty percent of the firearms sold in America today are not subject to background checks. What difference does that make? Let me tell you of a story going back to a moment in history in my state of Illinois that illustrates why this is so important. Ricky Birdsong was the head coach of the Northwestern University men's basketball team back in the 1990s. He was a great fellow. He was a loving husband, father of three children, and a man of deep Christian faith. On July the 2nd, 1999, Coach Birdsong was walking with two of his children through his neighborhood in Skokie, Illinois, a great town. A white supremacist drove up and shot Ricky Birdsong to death in front of his kids. He was 43 years old. This gunman ended up going on a shooting spree for days across Illinois and Indiana, randomly targeting African Americans, Jews, and Asian Americans. In the end, he killed two and wounded nine. Here's the reality. The man who did the shooting never, ever should have owned a gun. He was prohibited by law from buying guns because of a domestic violence restraining order against him. Before his murderous rampage, he tried to buy a gun from a federally licensed dealer in Peoria Heights, Illinois. He was rejected 
when the background check revealed that he was prohibited from purchasing a gun. But this white supremacist took advantage of a gap in our background check laws that still exists today. He found an advertisement for guns in the classified ad section of a newspaper. A gun trafficker named Donald Fissinger had been buying guns from a dealer, over 72 guns in a two-year period, then turning around and reselling them through classified ads to buyers who wouldn't have to go through a background check. Ricky Birdsong's killer bought two handguns from Fessinger without a background check. He then used those guns on the shooting spree and killed Ricky Birdsong on the streets of Skokie in front of his children. The amendment which is before us today would, that, would make that more difficult, if not impossible. Under the Manchin-Toomey Amendment, a background check would be required to sell guns advertised in a newspaper. That would have shut down the opportunity for Ricky Birdsong's killer to get this murderous weapon. That's one of the issues before us, and it's a critically important one. Joe Manchin's from West Virginia. Joe Manchin's a conservative Democrat. No question about it. No debate on that issue. Pat Toomey is one of the most conservative Republicans from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The two of them came together and said, let's write something that is respectful of the Second Amendment, respectful of the rights of guns, gun owners, but closes the gaps in the law when it comes to background checks. I think they've done a good job. But let me add quickly. They put some things in this amendment I don't like at all. Let me be specific. The amendment repeals the law that prevents gun dealers from selling handguns to out-of-state buyers and it expands civil immunity to unlicensed gun dealers. I don't want to vote for those two things. But this is the nature of a compromise and this is the nature of a Senate. If we're going to pass this, I have to be prepared to take on and accept some issues that I personally don't agree with because of the larger good. The notion of plugging this 40% gap in the sale of firearms to me is so compelling that I'm prepared to accept parts of this amendment I don't like. I'm never going to get exactly what I want on the floor of the Senate, nor will any senator, nor should they expect to. We have differences of opinion, differences of party, differences of philosophy. And I want to commend Senators Manchin and Toomey for stepping up here. This wasn't easy. They could have stepped back and said, let somebody else do this. They haven't. And I know they've taken some grief over it. The major gun lobby organizations oppose this Manchin-Toomey amendment. But we need to do this. Would it have saved the lives of those children at Newtown, Connecticut? No. This measure would not have because the guns he used were purchased by his mother who could legally purchase the guns. But it could have saved the life of Ricky Birdsong. And it could also save the lives of so many others who are being gunned down on the streets because people are owning and using guns who have no legal right to. The Manchin-Toomey Amendment moves us in the direction of closing that gap in the law. Now, I know that the gun lobby opposes this amendment, and I don't know what their position is on the underlying bill, but I know that overwhelmingly, Americans and gun owners support it. So here's the question. Can the Senate rise above the political pressure and vote for this measure? We need 60 votes, and it means it has to be bipartisan. Not just the majority on this side of the aisle, but a good number on the other side. I'm encouraged by last week's vote because last week we had a preliminary vote, a procedural vote, about whether we were even going to debate this issue, and there was a question about it. Before the vote came up, 13 Republican senators, including the Republican minority leader, sent a letter, public letter, saying they were going to oppose any effort to even debate the gun issue on the floor of the Senate. It looked pretty bad when the Republican leader took that position. But 16 Republican senators stepped up and showed, I thought, courage and a commitment to this institution by voting with us to move forward on this debate. I'm not assuming their votes on any issues but I want to commend them in the spirit of this institution 
which has failed in recent years to accept its mandate to deliberate and to vote on the most important issues of our time, I want to commend them for remembering that and for committing themselves to at least engaging this debate on the floor of the United States Senate. What about background checks in the Second Amendment? Well, the gun lobby argues that background checks are unconstitutional, even though Justice Scalia made it clear in the Heller decision, which was the decision on the Second Amendment, that said basically Second Amendment is a personal right to bear arms, not the right of a militia, which had been argued for years. Scalia said in that decision, laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms are presumptively lawful. So there's no doubt, at least in Scalia's mind, or, nor mine, that a background check is consistent with the Second Amendment. The gun lobby also argues that background checks are ineffective. You've heard this argument, haven't you? Well, go ahead and pass all the laws you want, and all the law-abiding citizens will live by them, but the criminals won't. Here's what they fail to note. Nearly two million, nearly two million prohibited purchasers have been blocked from buying a gun since background checks went into effect. They were so stupid, so careless, they tried to buy a gun anyway. They were stopped. The argument, of course, then goes, well, why are there so many crime, gun crimes committed? Well, because they get guns through other means, which is another part of the bill. Straw purchasers, for example, through the ads in the newspaper that I mentioned earlier. And the argument that unless a law is airtight and will stop all gun violence, we shouldn't pass it, are we going to use that standard for speeding on highways? Are we going to use that standard for texting on highways? I don't think so. We do our best to set a reasonable standard for the good of this society, understanding there will be those who violate the law. The same thing holds true in this argument. The gun lobby argues we should not improve background checks until we prosecute more cases where buyers fail their background checks. Well, what is the agency that gathers the information for that prosecution? ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. If you look at that agency, you'll note that for years now, the gun lobby and the NRA have worked to keep this as a leaderless agency and to make sure it didn't have the power to enforce the laws on the books. They can't have it both ways. They can't stop the ATF from its job and then argue we don't prosecute these gun, these gun violations seriously. Here's the bottom line. We're going to have votes soon to see where the members of the United States Senate stand. Are they going to stand with our police officers, religious leaders, teachers, prosecutors, doctors, mayors, the victims of gun violence and their families? Are they going to stand with a strong majority, 90% of Americans, who support these reform proposals to save lives in this country? Or will they stand with a gun lobby that refuses to compromise even when lives could be saved? I know where I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand with Ricky Birdsong's family and his widow, Sherilyn. She wrote me earlier this year when I held a hearing on gun violence, and this is what she said. How a criminal is able to buy a gun with no questions asked is absurd. Something must be done about it. End of quote. An important question from an important person whose life was changed forever because we do not have a strong law or enforce it. I stand with so many other families who've suffered tragedy, those families from Newtown who were here last week, the families of victims in my hometown of East St. Louis, Illinois, and in the city of Chicago that I'm honored to represent. They are sick and tired of a gun lobby that puts industry profits before common sense, and they are tired of a gun lobby having its way in Congress year after deadly year. I urge my, urge my colleagues to join with the majority of Americans who support common sense reforms for gun safety. I urge my colleagues to support the compromise Manchin-Toomey Amendment and the bipartisan legislation on the Senate floor. Mr. President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Well, debate has gotten underway in the Senate on the firearms bill, although most of the morning has been taking up with general remarks in the aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombings yesterday. The Senate is expected to recess at 12.30 for their weekly party lunches. President Obama says that the explosions at the marathon are being investigated as an act of terrorism. Although authorities still don't know who's responsible, he called the bombings a heinous and cowardly act used to target innocent civilians. He spoke to reporters after a briefing by his national security team earlier today. He's ordering flags at all government buildings to be flown at half-staff in honor of the victims. While we wait for a further Senate debate, we will get the latest on the Boston Marathon bombings from an investigator who joined us on this morning's Washington Journal. Discussion that we had with all of you earlier about that Boston bombing yesterday appears to be a terrorist attack. That from a White House official and the White House official saying yesterday that it will be treated as such as well. The president spoke in the briefing room yesterday. He did not call it an act of terror. The Wall Street Journal front page this morning has this headline, Deadly Blasts Rock Boston. Act of terror kills at least three, injures 140. That number now at about 152 according to uh, news reports uh, this morning. Also, uh, that eight-year-old boy has been identified as well who was killed in the bombings yesterday. We want to get your thoughts on this this morning. Republicans 202-585-3881, Democrats 202-585-3880, and Independents, all others, call us at 202-585-3882. We'll have a fourth line for Boston residents as well, 202-585-3883. Uh, this is uh, the front page of the New York Times this morning with their headline, Blast at Boston Marathon Kills Three, Injures uh, 100. Again, that number at about 152, according to uh, the Boston Globe uh, earlier this morning. And uh, this is what they had to say inside the New York Times this morning. The timing of the explosions around 2.50 p.m. Eastern Time was especially devastating because they happened when a high concentration of runners in the main field were arriving at the finish line on Bolston Street. In last year's Boston Marathon, for example, more than 9,100 crossed the finish line, 42% of all finishers in the 30 minutes before and after the time of the explosions. This year, more than 23,000 people started the race in near perfect conditions. Only about 17,580 finished. And as we said, three people killed in that. Uh, also this morning in the papers, here's the Baltimore Sun with a little bit more detail uh, about this. Boston officials told reporters at a nationally televised briefing that there were no suspects, but they acknowledged they were questioning some people. Federal law enforcement officials said authorities were questioning a Saudi national who was taken to a Boston hospital with injuries. The official also said authorities are desperately seeking a Penske rental truck seen leaving the race site. And that, as also the Associated Press uh, res reporting this morning, about uh, 26 minutes ago or so, uh, authorities investigating the Boston Marathon bombing aren't saying whether they're looking at any possible suspects, but the fire department in the Boston suburb of Revere says on its Facebook page that firefighters responded overnight to the search for a person of interest, and so they are uh, have gone through and started looking for uh, possible information at an apartment in that area of Boston executing a search warrant in that case. We want to welcome to the table now Stephen Emerson, who is the founder and executive director of the Investigative Project on Terrorism. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Let's first begin with calling this an act of terror. We heard that from uh, a White House official yesterday. What does that mean when you define it as that? going forward. An act of terror, terrorism is defined as the use of political violence against civilians for political purposes. Now it could be just an anarchist, um, I mean we're not 100 percent sure it's terrorism but we're pretty 99 percent sure it is. Uh, number two, um, given what they have found so far, and I'm not going to go into it because I've been given privy to certain in classified information, it appears that it was a political act of terrorism done for political reasons. Uh, yes, there has been no person arrested. There have been people interrogated. There have been raids, not, not just on one house, but on several houses. And on the Facebook page of the person of interest, there were in interesting entries that showed an animus toward the United States. Again, he has not been convicted, but 
the burns on his, uh, on his uh, skin matched the explosive residue of the bomb that exploded. Is this the Saudi national or are those two different people? Uh, the Saudi national. It is. Why are you privy to certain information? Well, and what can you tell us about that information? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be careful because, again, uh, we don't want to jump to conclusions. Again, nobody's been arrested. Uh, nobody's been charged. You know, they're people of interest. This is just a beginning of the investigation. The FBI does a fantastic job of solving crimes, okay? And only after 9-11 did they start doing criminal intelligence ahead of time, that is collection of intelligence. So right now they're going through, they're going through the terrorist watch list, which has got hundreds of thousands of people. They're going through all people who've come to the United States in the last three weeks. They're going to any, any store that sold ammonium nitrate or any type of explosive residue. They're going to stores that sold maybe timers. They're also going to stores that sold maybe ball bearings because ball bearings are a, high, a highlight of the uh, jihad civil, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the jihadist type of suicide bombing in the Middle East. Again, that doesn't make it the Middle East, but it could have been imported. Uh, again, we don't want to jump to conclusions, and, and privy to the information is because I worked in the area of counterterrorism. My organization worked for the FBI, worked for the Joint Terrorism Task Force with agencies, and we helped provide information. In fact, we found a Facebook page of the person of interest last night before the FBI did. How? Uh, <laughs> we have good investigators, um, and um, we have good sources. Again, um, w our, our mission is sort of schizophrenic at the organization. Half of it works with the government um, to provide information, and we're sort of classified. We're not really super classified in a formal way, but we're, we're bound to confidentiality. The other half publishes information. Well, since you found that information and it was public on a Facebook page, what sort of things were this, was this person of interest writing on well, the Facebook page that made you and, and the FBI concerned? Well, first of all, we did not get to the internal Facebook page because you, you'd have to get his permission, okay? We called the number and we only got voicemail. Uh, number two, there were pictures, lots of pictures of his friends. Some of them showed anti-American animus, such as support from the Muslim Brotherhood. Again, I, I want to be very clear here that, you know, again, a person of interest, he could have just been an innocent bystander, um, but again, um, he definitely is a person of interest. So the apartment that the FBI is, has gone through, has executed a, a search warrant for, is the Saudi national who has been reported on, uh, was treated at hospitals, in the area for burns and for other injuries. Right, he was. This is not his room. This is not his house. This is somebody else's house where he might have stayed, but he had a different address. And uh, they're looking at the other people on the Facebook page, on the opening, you know the way Facebook page right. works, you know, they're opening friends and everything. And there, there are a lot of Saudi nationals there. Um, and, and some of them, again, have insignias or placards that are anti-American. CNN was reporting that uh, ball bearings were found in the injuries of, of those victims at the Boston bombings. What does that tell you about the signature of this bomb? Very good question. The signature of the bomb has evolved into one of the most sophisticated tools by FBI forensic analysis in the last 10 years. I mean, they can tell from the, de from the detonation, from the chemical explosive, from the residue, from the timer, uh, from how it exploded, so many things. Um, um, th they can, uh, combined of course with addendum material such as, let's say, uh, some of the uh, film and, and, and video cameras that they have rampant throughout Boston, such as purchases of chemicals in the last three weeks, such as who came into the United States in the last three or four weeks, uh, plus persons of interest that would be on the terrorism watch list. There are 500,000 people on the terrorism watch list. Um, now, they're not all guilty of terrorism, but there's some connection there. So um, they're going through all the databases. The 800 FBI agents were, were assigned to this case yesterday. That's an amazing number. Remember, this is the first bombing that succeeded since 9-11. There were three other attacks since 9-11. All were shooting attacks. All were convicted or found dead. Uh, this is the first actual successful bombing. The New York Times Square bombing didn't, didn't detonate because of a malfunction. And so this is the first bombing that occurred. Now again, for a, for a uh, just so you know, in terms of sort of signatures, Al-Qaeda usually you, tries to kill as many people as possible, putting bombs in concentrated areas of population, uh, buses, uh, trains, 
stadiums, uh, you know, all types of New York Times Square. So this was not in that same type of vein. It didn't, you know, congregate around concentrations of people. So uh, t tell me this about <laughs> where we stand today. Uh, what are your sources telling you about the threat? Uh, the Boston, the, the governor has said that uh, they're still under uh, high security alert in that city. What about the rest of the country? Well, they have to be. I mean, this is this is normal practice anymore. You know, since 9/11, you know, once you, once uh, one city gets hit, it's very possible and another city gets hit. You know, after 9/11, there were tremendous fears that there were going to be suicide bombings around the country in different cities. Okay, it didn't materialize, by the way. Um, maybe something is going to materialize now. Again, we don't know if it's a domestic or foreign. Uh, you know, we're sort of the, the, the forensic analysis is leaning toward foreign, but again, that's not a definitive answer at this point. It could take them someplace else. They're very open-minded, okay? Uh, and they've got other persons of interest as well. This is from uh, Leslie Clark, uh, I assume a reporter who's tweeting this in, uh, at the Westin Hotel for FBI presser, dogs checking journos' bags as uh, they enter this for the, uh, the FBI's press conference. Absolutely. R remember that the journalists have been used in the past as terrorists, or terrorists have used journalist passages, uh, you know, credentials as terrorists. So th they're going to check everybody. And I mean, nobody's exempt. We're going to try to uh, get live coverage of that FBI press briefing when it happens. Uh, we'll bring you and uh, possibly be able to uh, bring you a little bit of that as we continue here to talk to uh, Steve Emerson, who's joining us to talk about the yeah. Boston bombings. And Go by ahead. the way, I think they're going to be very circumspect in what they say because okay. they don't want to prejudice the case. Okay? And they're going to be much more reluctant to revealing details. The details that are coming out are being leaked out unofficially, okay? And that's why I'm not really willing to leak them out myself. I'm not really uh, authorized to leak them out. I mean, I, I know stuff that is conjectural, that is more than conjectural, that is forensic. But again, we don't have an answer here. Well, let's talk about forensics a little bit, um, because you talked about this, the, the system that we have for tracking bombs, the signature part The signature, of absolutely. And, and the Wall Street Journal writes about that this morning. Tripwires can spot would-be bombers, but they write in here, they know it doesn't always work. It doesn't, there are tag-ins for explosives. There are known types of bombing timers, 